Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. I'm so glad you could all join us again this week. And uh, today we're going to continue a conversation that we've been having on this show now uh, for quite a while, and that would be about the impact of, of Internet pornography on our culture at large. Most of you know that I do quite a bit of speaking and, and research on pornography. There's a couple of chapters in my own book, The Culture War, on pornography, and, and, and it's one of those things that keeps on coming up because the more I the more I write about pornography, the more I speak about pornography. I I've spoken at three high schools just in the last month. Uh, earlier this week, I spoke to grades seven through twelve on porn, and nonstop. You see, you can see when you're speaking the faces of of these kids, and you know that so many of them have been impacted by pornography already. And it's so important that we really get the information. Uh, out there, because people need to realize that this this information they're consuming uh, is is stuff that's going to impact them for the rest of their lives. A lot of people, when they look at porn, they think they're making a decision uh, for right now. They think, you know what, I'm going to look at porn right now because I feel like looking at porn right now, and they don't realize that they're actually making a decision for the rest of their lives. And that's why I do so many interviews on this topic, and I try to talk to so many experts on the spread of pornography and the impact that it has in hopes that this information will dissuade some people uh, from, from beginning to look at porn, and hopefully people who are looking at porn will finally get the incentive they need uh, to kick the habit for good. So today I talked to somebody I met back in the fall uh, when I went to the Nicosi Conference in Texas, and his name is Dr. John Fobert, and he had uh, just written, he's just written a book. <clears throat> it's actually the 10th book he's written, but this book is, is called How Pornography Harms, what today's teens, young adults, parents, and pastors need to know. Now, uh, Dr. Fulbert actually has, has quite an impressive uh, of resume, and he's done an extensive amount of research on this. He's an endowed professor of higher education and student affairs at Oklahoma State University. Uh, his undergrad degree was in psychology and sociology from the College of William and Mary. His master's degree is in psych from the University of Richmond, and his Ph.D., is from the University of Maryland at College Park. So he's an interdisciplinary scholar. He's got over 500 peer-reviewed publications. He's written seven books about the prevention of sexual violence, two about managing life in college residence halls, and now the book on pornography is his 10th book. And he agreed to come on this show and have a discussion about his book and about his conclusions and, and give people some advice and, and, and explain what he thinks people should be doing to react to the porn epidemic. And I hope you find the conversation as useful as I did. So first off, what made you write a book about pornography? <laughs> Um, I, it's sort of a a long story, I guess. I've done research on uh, sexual violence and how to prevent it for 25 years, and about 10 years ago, I began to see the connections between pornography and sexual violence and wasn't really sure if that was kind of a blip on the screen or something pretty serious. And um, as I delved into it more deeply, I saw that it, in fact, uh, was a big deal. And simultaneously, I was uh, trying to figure out a way that I could better serve the church uh, with some of my work and um, certainly working on sexual violence prevention didn't harm the church, but it, but I wanted to do something more direct. And um, I noted that there were many men in the church who I knew who were struggling to various degrees with pornography. And so I figured that was probably a, a fruitful area to focus on. And so it's also the kind of thing that the more deep you get into it, the more meaningful you find the work uh, is. So um, after about 10, well, I guess about nine years of researching it, I figured I had a book in me. So, um, so I wrote it. So I, I actually met you at a conference where a lot of people were delineating the thesis that, that pornography fuels sexual assault. And you might know mm -hmm. this, but here in Canada, actually, the uh, Standing Committee on Health is, is currently examining that connection right now. So how much of, of your research relied on, on the work of people like Dr. Mary Ann Layden, and how much of your research uh, brought something entirely new to the table on the conversation on porn? Well, I, Dr. Mary Ann Layden, I think, does a very good job conceptualizing the issue. Um, and a lot of her her book chapters and such, I think, are influential. Uh, the, the 
things that I would look to a little bit more strongly would be peer-reviewed publications that are uh, either correlational or causal or experimental. And uh, there are over 50 studies that draw a direct link between pornography and sexual assault. It's fairly conclusive. Um, And so those are the ones that I rely on uh, the most. Well, it's interesting because I've tangled with uh, Dr. David Lay and a couple of uh-huh. the, the, the pro-porn professors online. Mm-hmm. Basically, all of them say, you know, porn is actually beneficial. It's not in any way harmful. And then you have everybody from, from religious people such as yourself to, to people like Dr. Gail Dines, who's a feminist scholar, all saying the same mm-hmm. thing, which is that the, mm-hmm. the impact of pornography is obvious. Why isn't it obvious to people like them? Well, I guess I have a few thoughts. And, you know, yes, indeed, I'm a Christian and I write from that worldview. But, you know, my my um, vocation is as a data guy. I'm a professor. I work in a secular institution and I have to live up to the standards of research at a secular institution. So uh, it is plainly obvious to, I would say, anyone who isn't reading uh, research literature with their own bias and or uh, trying to cherry pick studies, that there are numerous harms of pornography. Why I think there can be a difference for some people is that they'll look at one study and they'll think that one study is worth uh, generalizing and maybe it surveys porn users themselves and asks them, do you find it harmful? And they say, no, I don't find it harmful. Well, that that's not a very good way of doing a study. Um, right. You you really need to take a look at a specific variable and measure it. And uh, for example, um, erectile dysfunction is certainly higher in uh, in in men who use more pornography. Sexual violence is is activated by pornography. Um, quality relationships is affected. Men's sexual satisfaction is lower. So. It's it's hard for me to imagine someone who's a serious scholar coming to the conclusion that um, that there isn't a connection between porn and many harms. I, my general sense is that the pro-porn side tends to be a little bit more interested in selling books and magazines and uh, themselves. I can, and that's just my general impression. Right, so when you talk about these 50 studies, what what for you was the most compelling evidence of connections between uh, sexual assault and pornography, because proving causality is very different. It's very difficult, pardon me, but a lot of scholars, yourself included, are quite convinced that that correlation exists. Yes. Well, the correlation does exist. I mean, that's just sort of a, a material fact. Right. Um, the, the, one of the ways that you can determine causality is with an experimental study. And so, for example, you expose similar people to the same uh, situation or stimulus, and you vary one factor and see what the result is. So, we, it, you know, we, we can't go to six, well, to like 12-year-old boys and show them porn and see what their behavior uh-huh. is, because that's, you know, obviously unethical. But, um, but for college uh, students, uh, there have been studies that have been done, for example, um, to measure things like uh, aggression, so just one type of violence. What they'll do is they put um, men in a room and they have them watch either a Disney film or a porn film, and then as they leave the testing area, they have someone bump into them and they see does the guy, does the research subject punch this guy back or just say, oh, excuse me, and um the guys who had just seen porn were much more physically aggressive, um, and that was that was shown from a causal perspective. I think that the one of the studies that I found most convincing was one that was done by neurologists, and they actually scanned the brains of men with an MRI as they were watching porn, and the the parts of the brain that lit up were the parts of the brain that refer to objects and not people. So we've we've long known that when you make someone into less than a uh, person, they then it's it's more likely that you'll be violent against them. So I I, I think that's a piece of it. I've done a few studies myself uh, replicating the uh, the porn leads to more violence. Uh, the uh, type of, of finding. So uh, I find that uh, convincing. I mean, the, the, the thing is, when you have 50 studies that show the same thing, 
the odds are that they're wrong is one in 88 deaths trillion. And it's, I find it impossible to be anyone with character to argue against that. Why do you think it took people so long to figure this out? Because besides the fact that there's a lot of research out there, this this just actually seems to make a lot of sense, right? When people say, mm-hmm. well, you know, if, if you've got a culture consuming on a mass scale, um, <clears throat> material that portrays sexual violence and sexual assault as an erotic event, uh, it just stands to reason that a number of people are going to want to try that out for themselves, especially considering the fact that the entire marketing industry is based on the idea that repeated exposure to something is going to attract somebody to something. Uh, mm-hmm. This is this is a very standard thing uh, that's utilized by almost every major business that, that, that tries to market anything at all. So why has this taken people so long to figure out? Well, I think that's a good question. I, I think certainly feminists were talking about this in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of their arguments were more theoretical than empirical. Uh, and and indeed, in the 80s, there were, were um, different laws put in place to try and combat pornography, but it wasn't it, it, it wasn't something that was very commonly discussed. I think as people, even just 10 years ago, started to realize, whoa, there's a lot more to this in terms of the harms, um, and that's actually right around the same time pornography became much more violent, and so it was easier to make the argument that there's a harm involved. Uh, you, you just have more studies coming out showing the same thing, and um, and honestly, you have a, a a large increase in erectile dysfunction in men under 30. I mean, in the 90s, it was seven uh, percent, and then by 2014, it was 33 percent of uh, men under 30, and that's going to get a guy's attention. Pretty quickly, yes. Now, when people talk about the rates of sexual assault, I remember attending your lecture uh, at mm-hmm. the conference in Texas last fall, and you said that mm-hmm. a lot of the numbers that are commonly used by news outlets and politicians aren't correct, and that the numbers you were looking at uh, were different. Could you explain that to our audience? Because I think that that's really helpful information to have. Of course, of course. Um, and, and I would say that a lot of people in the media don't mean to misquote the numbers. Mm-hmm. They just make a leap uh, somehow right. that isn't appropriate. So, for example, there are many different uh, studies that have been done nationwide in the states that have shown that uh, if, if you're particularly looking at college students, 5% of college women survive either rape or attempted rape in any given school year. Now, what some some news outlets will do is they'll multiply that by four or by five, assuming that a woman is in college for four or five years, and then they'll say, well, somewhere between one in four and one in five women is uh, raped during college. And they're leaving off the attempted rape piece. They're also, uh, they don't know enough about statistics to know that there are a lot of women who were raped more than once. And so you'd be double counting some people. Uh Now, it is accurate, and it's been shown in many studies over the years, that one in four college women have experienced rape or attempted rape at some point in their lifetime. But a lot of people, when they quote that statistic, leave out the very important part at some point in their lifetime. So it could have been when they were 14 or 16, or it could have been when they were in college. So those are the two statistics, at least when it comes to women, that I think are um, the most replicated and reliable. And when it comes to men, about 1%, a little less than 1% of college men experience rape or attempted rape in any given year. Um, The interesting statistics on men uh, is that you can get a figure as high as one in six men having been sexually assaulted if you include child sexual abuse in your measure. So, uh, yeah, so that, that is, uh, that's another one I think is pretty reliable. What do you think that people should be concerned about first and foremost? Because we're talking about numbers that are astronomical. I was taking a look at the Pornhub stats for last year, and Mm -hmm. it was over 500,000 years of pornography that got consumed in a single year. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. There was something like 12 porn videos were consumed for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Like These yeah, numbers are so that. staggering yeah. that they're really yeah. hard to wrap yeah. your head around. So on, mm-hmm. on just the basic individual level, which is, is how change needs to, to start, 
What mm-hmm. do you think is the number one thing we should be concerned about? What in your book uh, do you think people should pay the most attention to? Well, I think parents need to wake the heck up and stop giving their 12-year-olds iPhones. Right. There is no earthly reason why a 12-year-old needs an iPhone uh, or, or Android. I'm not talking brand here. Right. It, you know, it, it, is, it is essentially putting the world supply of pornography in their hands. So um, if a 12-year-old needs a phone, get them one that, um, that doesn't have pictures on it, and those are now more available because there's a market for them. So I think if, if people could pay... Uh, attention to anything in particular that I wrote in the book, How Pornography Harms, it would be what is this doing to kids and how can parents uh, intervene to protect their kids? We don't, you know, it, it, it's it's not a matter of, you know, little Johnny looking at his dad's Playboy. It's It's a matter of looking at gratuitously violent content that shapes and reach rewires the brains of a 13 year old um so we now have young kids already addicted to pornography and the kind of porn that they're addicted on is horribly violent and it's teaching them that women aren't people and that the way that you uh have sex is you hit them and you ejaculate on their face and that's is is just horrible and um it's anything but healthy one of the things that I've <clears throat> noticed is I, I get asked to speak uh, a lot of places on pornography. I mm-hmm. spoke to a uh, high school just this week as well to a parents group. Is mm-hmm. I get the feeling that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. Is that mm-hmm. the, the kids that come forward and talk to me, essentially we have the first generation that was raised on, on a diet of Internet porn. Statistics are already mm-hmm. saying that something like 53% of marriages actually cite compulsive porn use when they break up. So we know mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. is just coming. So I, mm-hmm. get, I get the feeling, looking at, at the, the research you've done and, and a number of other scholars have done, and just all the kids that I'm talking to, that the worst is yet to come. That everybody, a lot of people are going to come around uh, to the realization that scholars like yourself are right, but because they have to, because the fallout is obvious, not because they want to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think you're correct. I mean, I think there's, uh, to an extent, we have men in their 20s now who have been raised on internet pornography, but there was a whole new um, phenomenon that once high-speed internet hit, uh, because you can see so many more images so quickly and rifle through them that the dopamine uh, spike that you get from that is impossible to be matched from a person. And so, um, and w- co- you combine that with the introduction of smartphones. Uh, you know, you, if you take a look at the stats from 2008 to 2011, uh, in terms of boys who are looking at hardcore internet pornography, it went from 14% to 49% in just three years. Uh, and that period is when we have uh, smartphones becoming fairly ubiquitous. So, yeah, I would, I would agree, uh, sadly, with your uh, statement that we haven't even begun to see the worst of it yet, and um, and it paints a pretty dark picture, uh, which which I hope people at least within their own families uh, and church communities and schools and uh, and elsewhere will wake up and say, it's time for us to do something right now, not tomorrow, but right now. To what extent do you find your message <clears throat> resonating? To what extent do you? Do you find people that hear uh, from you, read your book, attend one of your lectures where you explain that there's correlations between uh, pornography and sexual assault, and really take that seriously in, in a concrete way? Well, I think it, they they hear the bit about sexual assault, but they think to themselves, well, I don't commit sexual assault, and my, my son never would, and it would never happen to my daughter, that sort of thing. I, I say it anyway because I think it's important for the message to get across, but what I think they do hear more is erectile dysfunction. Uh, what they hear is the violence in porn, how it is scripted, and how it... Um, encourages young people to engage in, not only to engage in sexual activity at a young age, but to be violent with each other. Um, and it teaches women to accept that violence. That's the kind of thing that I think is is getting through and, and, and helping them to understand that it's going younger and younger ages in terms of who's using it and the and what they're looking at. So I am finding some of that resonating. And, he, and even in a lot of the secular audiences where I speak, I, there's a convention I've spoken at for 
probably about five years in a row on pornography. And the, the first year I did it, I had all kinds of pushback from people. And they're like, oh, you're sex negative, and this is not that big a deal. Well, I, and I spoke at that convention just this week and really only had one guy in the audience give me pushback. And the others were like, oh, crud, this is a problem. What do we do now? Right. So you, you do sense that people are increasingly waking up to what the problem is. I I am yes and you know well and you'll always have the porn apologists out there and you know the people want to make a dollar or more or a million off of saying oh porn is great and you should do this because it basically feeds the baser instincts of the public and it tells them what they want to hear I'm not in the business of telling people what they want to hear I'm in the uh, the the business of saying here's the data. Um, whether you read it in my book or someone else's, I hope you'll consider it and um, apply it to your life in the way that you think is most meaningful. Well, the, the title of your book is, is, is quite compelling. What you say is, is what today's teens, young adults, parents, and pastors need to know. Now, there's a mm-hmm. few stalking, uh, shocking statistics that have come out over the past couple of years on mm-hmm. porn in the church, uh, including yeah. numbers like 55% of evangelical pastors you know, having viewed porn in the last month. That obviously yeah. plays a pretty large role in whether or not it, people it, speak it, out. It does. I don't believe that statistic is uh, particularly reliable. Okay. I think we need. Yeah, I, I think we need to do a good job of looking, and I do, and I do this with any study. Look at the uh, methods that were chosen. How did they choose their sample? Um, and uh, how how large was their sample, and therefore also how generalizable it was. I mean, I, I, the, the data that I've seen that I think is a little bit more reliable on, on porn is that certainly many evangelical pastors have either struggled in the past, have seen it at some point in time, but in terms of current use, it's nowhere near 55%. Um, and I can't quote the number for you right off the top of my head, but I believe, you know, somewhere in the 10 to 20 percent range, um, which is problematic uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, in terms of looking at it in the last month or something of that sort. But uh, we're not talking more than half. And I also think we need to consider the, oh, the agenda who, of whoever might be writing it. Are they an independent scholar like myself or are they someone from the porn industry that's trying to say, hey, even the pastors are doing it? Um, so we have to be real careful about that. Right, because one of the people at the, the, at the uh, conference in Texas last fall who really emphasized uh, the issue was, was Josh McDowell, who did seem mm-hmm. to be very concerned about, about porn use in church leadership. But you've, yeah. your research, obviously, uh, has woken a lot of people up. Do you find a lot of people receptive um, to having a discussion in terms as blunt as the one we're having right now? Um, more men than women, to be honest with right. you. Um, and and I think men know a little bit more that it is a problem from their own personal experience. Although women are certainly increasingly using porn, although they're not, they don't tend to look at the more uh, incredibly violent stuff. I, I I I think once they actually get the sense that yes, their kid may be looking at it, or that they certainly will at some point in time, Th- those who consider it part of the responsibility of raising their children to help them make good decisions, they're listening. It's just, it's sometimes uh, when uh, there are different messages that are going to get through to different populations. And I think someone like me who speaks to a lot of different uh, conferences and churches and college students, I I do my best to reach the point where they're a little bit disgusted and they're very concerned, but they're not so disgusted that they stop listening. And that's a a delicate balance. I suppose the last question uh, I'd like to ask you, so uh, we can leave our listeners with this, what's the number one thing that everybody listening uh, should do immediately to fight porn in their own lives or, or in the lives of their families? Don't look at it. And um, if you have devices in the house, uh, filter them uh, with something like Covenant Eyes or one of the other products that's available out there uh, so that accidental or unintentional use doesn't happen and people don't start walking down that road. I mean, any if you have anyone in the house who's 11 years old uh, or older, I would... Uh, so have some serious filtering uh, in your house. And that's not going to get around everything, uh-huh. but it is going to start uh, to at least limit 
the amount that might be coming into your home. Um, so I think that's certainly a big thing. And, and at the same time, I think we need to start making conversations about pornography more normative in our culture so that it's not a taboo thing you can't talk about, but you can talk about it as something we need to protect our kids from this and we need to protect ourselves from this. And if someone's caught in it, we need to help ease them out. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this with us. Absolutely. I really appreciate the opportunity.